Welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm George Craw here with Rafe Shannon Craw. This series features acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some of the biggest questions of our time. Tonight, our speaker, Ari S. Friedlander, shares with us the critical link in the structure of healthy marine ecosystems and the tools that research teams at UC Santa Cruz have developed to study the lives of whales. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program, and we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded and will be available on the UC Santa Cruz YouTube channel. Our conversation tonight will be moderated by Professor uh, Raphael M. Cudella, who is a phytoplankton ecologist and a professor in the Ocean Sciences Department. He also runs the Biological and Satellite Oceanography Lab here at UC Santa Cruz. Professor Cadella received a bachelor's degree in biology marine sciences at Drake University and a PhD in biological sciences at the University of Southern California. His research interests include ecological model modeling and remote sensing, uh, satellite oceanography, phyto phytoplankton ecology, and harmful algal blooms as well as answering the fundamental question, what controls phytoplankton growth and distribution in the ocean? Professor Cadella, I hand the program over to you. Well, thanks very much, George. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce R.E.S. Friedlander, a professor of ocean sciences. He's an ecologist with a primary interest in understanding the relationship between the foraging behavior of marine mammals and their prey. Ari works on a wide range of marine mammal species, including baleen and toothed whales and dolphins across a range of geographic regions. Ari has long-term ecological research projects ongoing in Alaska, California, Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Antarctica. Ari has helped in the development of tag technology and analytical and visualization tools to better understand the underwater movements and behavior of marine mammals. In addition to being a professor of ocean science, Ari is an active member of the Society for Marine Mammalogy, where he acts as an associate editor for the journal Marine Mammal Science and also serves on the Conservation Committee. Ari is also a principal investigator in the Southern Ocean Research Partnership to conduct non-lethal research on cetaceans in the Southern Ocean. Ari is an internationally recognized expert, both in academic circles and in public venues. This includes appointment as the US delegate to the International Whaling Commission, and he's also one of the co-founders of the nonprofit California Ocean Alliance. And so it's my very great pleasure to, to turn it over to Ari and hear about his fantastic research. Thanks, Rafe. Um, and thank you, George and, and Rafe for having us here and, and to uh, Nikki and Nikki at Santa Cruz for inviting me to do this. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you some of the research that myself and my colleagues are doing uh, to better understand whales uh, and how the interactions between whales and their environment can tell us about the health of ocean systems. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully everything will work out and you guys will get to see what I'm talking about. So. All right, if I can just maybe get a, a quick thumbs up or something, uh, maybe Rafe or, or Nikki, just tell me if, if we are in presentation mode and you can see everything okay. Looks perfect, Ari. All right, thank you, Rafe. Okay, um, so first thing I wanna do is mention the fact that this research is being done in collaboration with a great number of partners in a very uh, large number of different places around the world. And the work that we're doing uh, really requires these logistic, um, uh, efforts from a lot of people and from a lot of different technologies, and I am greatly appreciative. And uh, this work is all a collective. We uh, none of this is my own independent research. Uh, also, I think first and foremost, uh, thanking UC Santa Cruz for giving me the opportunity to have um, an academic home here, uh, and to the Cross for having this lecture series, which allows us to present and share uh, some of the cool things that we do as part of the UC Santa Cruz research community. Um, the funding for this work is from a broad number of places, uh, and while the funding is great, I think the thing that I'm most um, proud of is that the research I'm going to talk today about has supported uh, over 100 undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students in my lab, as well as those of my uh, collaborators around the world. As a bit of a, an introduction to myself, uh, I'm a Connecticut Yankee by birth. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, 
Um, and I grew up in a part of the world in New England where industrial whaling was really uh, the foundation of the economy and what made that place go. And so from a young age, um, I was immersed in the culture of what whaling uh, was about, either through literature or art or science or just um, general day-to-day -day life. And so I had an appreciation for whales in some way uh, very early on. Uh, what I didn't know was that I grew up about 20 miles away from this guy, Nathaniel Palmer, on the right, who was a sealing captain and was the first person to actually step foot on the Antarctic continent in 1821. And he is the namesake for the National Science Foundation research, uh, both the Nathaniel Palmer as well as Palmer Station, where a lot of my research is conducted. Um, for my academic training, I was trained initially at UNC Wilmington uh, for my master's degree, and I studied uh, functional morphology and anatomy of marine, mile, uh, marine mammals and getting a perspective of understanding how these animals are evolved and are put together to live in the ocean uh, was really a foundational part of my education. Uh, I then went on to Duke University uh, and got my PhD in ecology working in a spatial ecology lab where I tried to understand how animals distributed themselves relative to their environment um, and how the adaptations that these animals have allow them to do that. At the same time, I started to get introduced to the Antarctic um, as a location for work um, and also as a place to, to inspire research and, and a lot of the other critical thinking uh, that myself and my colleagues do. In terms of my sort of academic philosophy then, uh, I feel strongly that understanding animals from the inside out, how they've evolved and how they've adapted for a particular environment allows you to better understand or contextualize the behaviors that animals do. And if you put that into the context of what the environment is like around those animals, that's the study of ecology. And so I think all three of these disciplines overlap. And I think one of the great things about being at Santa Cruz is that we have the opportunity to do all of these kinds of things um, within the department that I'm in, in ocean sciences, but also more broadly um, throughout the university with, with some of our great colleagues. In order to understand this in marine mammals, um, we need a couple of different tools. And the technology I'm gonna to talk to you guys tonight about is things that um, are traditional things like fisheries echo sounders that image the water column and tell us about how much prey is in there uh, and new technology like tags or, or bio, bio logging instruments that I'll talk to you a little bit more about. In terms of the output from the research, I think there's two things that are most critical for me. Um, Education and conservation are the two outputs that I think are the most important. Uh, education in the form of peer reviewed literature, but more broadly in terms of uh, exposing parts of our society that otherwise may not have the opportunity to either do this research or be um, sort of on the front lines of where that knowledge comes out. And so translating scientific information into ways that can be broadly uh, digested is very important. And I think that also serves the goal of conservation. Uh, as I'll talk a little bit about, Marine mammals have a pretty checkered past with humans and um, they're a good harbinger for ocean ecosystem health. And then there are things that we can or, or have done um, to help protect and, and conserve these animals that has uh, a larger impact of, of protecting ocean ecosystems. And I think that whales do offer us a really good model for studying these different types of disciplines and applying it for education and conservation. So why, why should we study whales? Or what are the things that we're interested in when we do study them? I'd like to believe that they're a good model for testing things uh, about fundamental biological, ecological, and physiological principles, things like optimal foraging theory, energetics, uh, physiological constraints of living in an ocean environment, the biomechanics of filter feeding, uh, how scaling of different body sizes impacts what animals can do. And we do a lot of these things, like I mentioned, with the technology of high resolution movement uh, and kinematic tags. I also think that we can make a good argument that the presence of whales in an ocean really reflects the emergent properties of an ocean that is functioning. These are the biggest animals on the planet. They have the largest energetic needs of any animals. And therefore, they, they can really only exist in areas where there's a lot of productivity and a lot of food for them. And that really only occurs when the ocean is, uh, is working and is healthy. And then I think it's very clear to me that whales are sentinels of changing environments and climate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then lastly, people care about whales um, for their societal value, for their emotional value. And there's also a growing understanding that just the heuristic value of having animals present um, is valuable as well. So I think marine mammals and cetaceans, whales in general, 
uh, kind of reflect all of these things and are, are important for us to think about. Now, in the ocean, one of the great things is that we have a great archaeological and prehistoric record. And there's this really amazing 100 million year dynasty in the ocean of giant filter feeding organisms being present. And these all evolved independently over time. So from going left to right, from manta rays to uh, whale sharks, to basking sharks, to a megamouth shark, to a baleen whale, there's been this independent evolution of very large bodied things in the ocean that eat very small things by filtering food out. And that should say something about what the oceans are like and what they uh, have a lot of and what the mechanisms are uh, that are the most efficient for, for feeding. I think it's important if we're gonna talk about baleen whales to talk very briefly about their evolution and when they occurred in the fossil record and why as well. So what this image shows is going from, uh, from the top down uh, from the present day to 40 million years ago, and from left to right, the size of those animals in meters from zero to about 25 meters. And what you see down here, the first mysticete that is at the bottom there, the mysticetes refer to baleen whales. Baleen is a keratinized structure in the mouth of these animals. It's not a tooth, it's more like your fingernail. It's effectively like a big comb that sits in your mouth that is very finely woven together and uh, acts like a sieve for very small particles. And so about 35 million years ago, the first mysticetes and the first baleen appeared in the fossil record. And what's interesting is that this coincides with when something called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current was established. The Antarctic continent had found its home at the bottom of the planet, and there is now a water mass that circulates around that continent unabated that allows for the circulation of nutrients in a highlight environment and for the production of a lot of very small bodied phytoplankton that require nutrients and light and very small bodied things in the ocean. And because of that, a feeding mechanism to be able to take advantage of that occurred. Now, interestingly, when baleen whales evolved, they were very small. They were five or six meters long, about the size of the smallest baleen whale that we have today. The, uh, the radiation of large body size in cetaceans really only occurred within the last few million years and this seems to be coincident with when you have more glacial cycling and coastal upwelling becoming more prominent around the globe. And Monterey Bay in our backyard is a perfect example of a system where you have coastal and wind uh, induced upwelling. Wind pushes water to a certain direction and it upwells nutrient rich water to the surface. And in combination with light, you have the conditions that are perfect for growing phytoplankton and the small bodied organisms that baleen whales feed on. So as the planet produced more and more of these types of environments, it allowed for the animals that feed on these small things to have more places to feed and more structure for that. And that allowed these animals to become bigger and bigger. And currently we're in the heyday of these baleen whales. The blue whale that we have around today is the largest animal um, that's ever existed that we know of in the fossil record. Now, if you wanna study baleen whales, um, what you probably should do is be smart like this woman here, Jane Goodall, one of the the most uh, amazing naturalists and scientists that we've ever had. And she set up a form of observational science where she would go out into a forest, watch animals in their environment, and be able to continuously document the behaviors, the relationships, um, the interactions among individuals, and use that information to understand a species. And that is a perfectly great thing to do in a terrestrial system where you can sit there and your animals don't go out of view from you, um, they may climb up in a tree and they may do things that make it a little more difficult, but they don't go literally a mile down into the ocean where you can't see them. Um, and so because of that, rather than having a notebook and a pen, uh, if you want to study whales, you've got to take advantage of and have access to a lot of different things just to be able to get a glimpse of these animals and to be able to do it in a way that allows you to quantify and understand and test some of these scientific principles. And so this, this image right here just shows sort of a number of the different kinds of tools that are available or that scientists have had to develop in order to be able to, to measure some of the basic life history parameters, behaviors, and physiology of marine mammals. And some of these include helicopters and satellites and drones and tags. Um, and today, what I'm going to talk to you guys about are a handful of methods that we are using um, in our colleague group to understand these animals. And it spans these biologging tags where you can see putting that on a blue whale. You can probably, someone in the audience I'm sure lives in one of those houses that you can see there uh, in Monterey Bay. 
We use drone technology to help measure animals in a quantitative way. We use echo sounders in the top right there to image the environment that the whales are in to better understand how much food is available to them. Those tags then allow us to animate and understand the motion of these animals in the environment. We can use actual um, models or stranded animals to help us understand the anatomy of these animals and how much they're able to consume in a given bite. And when we put that all together, we can then better understand how much food these whales eat and how much they need. And that can then tell us a little bit about how these animals fit in with the ocean uh, environment. So today I'm gonna to use data that come from uh, around the world, literally. Um, there's a culmination of about 10 years of effort by our research team here. We've deployed over 300 tags and we've measured over 75,000 feeding events. And we've tagged over half of the species in the world of, of whales. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. And on this image, you can, you can see um, the different species of whales that we've tagged and geographically where the data are coming from. Uh, California, the east coast of the US, um, South Africa, and the Antarctic. This is an image that I think is really cool. This is coming out um, in a paper by Paolo Segre, one of our, our postdoctoral students on the scaling of body size in baleen whales. And this is great because it shows a couple of different tools. These are all images collected from drones and all but I think one of the whales in here, the gray whale, I can't find it on. All of these whales have one of our little biologging tags on them. And what's amazing to me is that you can see how the shape and size of baleen whales differs. The far right, you have an Antarctic minke whale. That whale is about seven or eight meters long. And if you kind of you know, put your hand up there, you can see that that blue whale on the left is probably uh, about 25 meters long, which is a pretty big animal. Um, but really cool to be able to visualize the different size and shapes of these animals that we're working with. Now, the biologging tools that we're using are, are probably the coolest piece of engineering technology. These types of tags, motion sensing tags, have been around for about 20 years, and they continue to evolve. And one of the things that they've changed to now is not just measuring motion like your, your iPhone or a lot of smartphones do that have accelerometers and magnetometers and help you uh, understand orientation of animals, but these tags now also have acoustics and they also have video cameras, which is a really important thing. And I'm gonna show you the value of having a video camera on there so we can corroborate the sensor data, but we can also see what the environment is like around these whales, which helps us to provide context for why an animal is doing a certain thing. And these tags attach to animals with suction cups. They're non-invasive. They last for about two days on the whales. I mentioned they collect video and audio. It also has a GPS to geolocate itself and then a VHF antenna. Um, so when the tag does fall off the whale, it floats to the surface, that little antenna waves in the air and it sends out a little signal that we can listen for. We have to pick up the tags and actually offload the data. Um, and then we can recharge the battery, wipe the memory and deploy these tags again. So here's how we deploy these tags. This is putting a tag on an Antarctic minke whale. We use a handheld carbon fiber pole. When the whale comes to the surface, we try and uh, place ourselves close enough to them if the whale will allow us that we can just slap the tag on their back. This is in Anvord Bay, the Antarctic Peninsula, one of my most favorite places in the world. And uh, this again is the smallest baleen whale, an Antarctic minke whale. Um, the tags are nice because they're not invasive. They really don't affect the behavior of the animal. Um, and they allow us to really see the behavior of these animals as it naturally occurs. On the other end of the spectrum, this is putting a tag on a blue whale. I think this is off of Santa Barbara. This is now just using a, a, a camera that's on a helmet. This is a blue whale that's just come up from a long deep feed. So it's at the surface catching its breath. It'll take probably eight or 10 breaths. We slowly approach the animal from behind, making sure that we don't go on the flukes of the animal. And you'll see eventually the whale pops up and we accelerate and pop the tag on its back. I think on the next surface, and you'll see us accelerate. There we go. Tag goes on, and then you get this beautiful, fantastic image of a blue whale kind of swimming away gracefully from us. Gonna come up again, and what's great is if you look on this animal, you, you can barely see the tag on the animal, and the tag is about the size of a, a remote control. And if you see it, uh, where is it? There it is, just about to go back underwater there very small relative to the size of the animal. So now some of the things that the tags uh, provide for us, I mentioned uh, it gives us an indication of what the whale is doing, but what other animals in the environment are doing, which can be just as important. 
This is a great image uh, taken in a super group of humpback whales off of South Africa. You can see the type of prey that's in the environment right there. These are small krill, and you can see an animal that had just fed. Sea lions, other animals that are in the environment of these whales provides context for uh, us understanding what the tag data look like. Here's a closer, uh, closer to home view. This is a humpback whale in Monterey Bay. Uh, I love this. This one to me is kind of like the Star Wars episode. It looks like you're, you're kind of cruising through an asteroid field here of, of sea nettles. And then our, our friendly California sea lions here. And again, what this helps us to understand is interactions between animals and their environment. This group of hundreds and hundreds of sea lions is feeding on the same thing um, as these whales and how these two species coexist are questions that we're really interested in. But just some beautiful imagery of what, what the natural world looks like that we, uh, that we typically could not see otherwise. And then this is a really great video to demonstrate uh, the size of blue whales and how they feed. This was a video taken by a drone pilot off of the Blackfin, which is one of the local whale watching boats in Monterey. You can see the descended throat pouch in that blue whale that, has, that it has just fed. Uh, the Blackfin is a 65 foot long vessel. So you can see how big that blue whale is relative to it. And here's the blue whale coming up to the surface and feeding, opening its mouth. You can see the krill that it's feeding on dispersed at the surface. And then that ventral pouch underneath inflates with water. You see it streaming out of the mouth of the whale right there. It's gonna use its tongue to help push out all the water, take about a minute to process that, push out the water and all the krill get left behind in the mouth of the whale. And this is one of the best images that we've ever seen of, of a surface feeding blue whale. And it's from right in our backyard, which is pretty awesome. And then another thing that we can do is look at the environment around the animals, like I mentioned. This is a tag. This is the first ever of its kind on an Antarctic minke whale. And you're on the left side of the animal here. And what's great is you see this animal cruising underneath sea ice. And this is allowing us to understand how this whale uses that sea ice environment, how it navigates in sea ice, and the things that that environment either allows it to do or the limitations. So from this type of information, we can look and see whether or not whales feed preferentially under sea ice or whether they're in open water more often or what behaviors might be different in different types of physical environments. And this kind of uh, information is something that you really couldn't get from any other type of, uh, or type of tool or remote sensing. You're literally at the scale of the whale and what the whale is experiencing. Now, once we get the data back, one of the things that's really important for us is to visualize it and put the animal into the three-dimensional space of the ocean. And this is a tool that we've created with some software engineers to turn the track of the whale into a ribbon. So the orientation of the whale is actually what you see in this ribbon. Each of these little chevrons is one second in time. The blue and the red triangles are when the animal is, is actively accelerating. And you see that the animal just doesn't dive down and come back up to the surface like it, you might see in two dimensions, but it's moving around and finding its way through an environment. It's now gonna kind of move and go back and forth through an area numerous times. This is actually when this whale is feeding. And this gives us a much better perspective of, of space use and three-dimensional space use and how the animals interact with their ocean environment. But there is one thing missing from here and that's the prey. And I'll talk a little bit about how we incorporate that next. But this does show us the, the way that these animals use the underwater environment in a way that you couldn't tell um, if you couldn't turn that track of the whale into a three-dimensional thing. One of the other really interesting things that we're able to do is look at individuality in these animals. And what the images on the left here show are what's called bubble net feeding. That image on the top there is a demonstration of a humpback whale blowing a bubble net or a curtain of, of bubbles around a school of fish or krill we think it does this to help concentrate the prey and then the whale comes up through the middle of them or the group of whales and feeds on that mass of prey that's been condensed. And what's very cool is that each of these seven different um, plots here are different whales doing the same type of behavior, but you can see that each of them has their own specific way of doing it. So the animal 189B04 comes in from the right and it does two loops at the same depth and then comes up through the middle. The one next to it does three loops in a spiral as it ascends. The one next to it only does two loops. 
And then the fourth one on the right seems to not really know what it's doing. That might be a young animal that's just figuring things out, or it has a different role in the group of bubble net feeders. But seeing that there are individual um, things that these whales do is a really interesting way that they connect to us. Now, the, the graph on the bottom right is just to demonstrate one other really interesting facet of these animals, and that's that they show the same handedness um, as we do as humans and other animals in the natural kingdom. For animals that show a preference for doing a behavior to one side or the other, it's almost 90% right-sided. About 88% of us are right-handed, different percentage, a smaller percentage are left-handed, even smaller percentage can use both our hands. And what that bottom graph simply demonstrates is that when we look at which way whales roll or which way they blow bubble nets when they're feeding, they show the same frequency of being most right side dominant versus left side dominant, which is another interesting way that we can connect with these animals. All right, so I mentioned now the most critical factor to understand how much whales eat and how they feed is to measure the prey at the same time that we're actually putting these tags on these animals. And this is a figure from a paper we published in Science led by Jeremy Goldbogen, um, one of my colleagues at Stanford, that shows sort of the, the progression of what we do here. So you see a tag being put on the back of the whale. Just below that is a two-dimensional plot that shows the depth of the whale over time as you go up and down and left to right. The little red dots on there are every time that the whale feeds. And the way that we can determine whether or not the whale is feeding is by looking at these videos and also looking at the sensors on the tag that tell us when the animal opens its mouth. In this case here, the green line that is in the graph on the right shows the speed of that whale. And what we found with baleen whales is when they want to feed, they accelerate very quickly. And when they open that massive mouth, it's like opening a parachute underwater. The speed of the whales drops down dramatically. And so we can look for signatures in the tag data where you have a rapid acceleration and deceleration that indicate where feeding occurs. If we map something like prey and we go out there and measure how much food is in the environment at the same time and overlay that, with the tracks of the whales and where they forage, which is what you see on the bottom, we have a very powerful tool for now being able to say, how are whales making decisions about where they're feeding, when they're feeding, what they're feeding on, and how much they might actually be eating, which is one of the fundamental questions that we've been uh, struggling to answer in the scientific community. Now, this is one of the demonstrations of showing you what it looks like when a blue whale feeds. Um, but what's amazing about this is not only do you see when the blue whale that's tagged feeds, but you also see a second blue whale here. And to me, this is one of the most amazing pieces of footage because these are some of the most endangered whales on the planet. And we very, very rarely get this kind of view. But what you see on this bottom graph here is this green line where the whale is accelerating very quickly and then decelerating very quickly. So there, that animal just opened its mouth, you can see its throat grooves extending, and then the tag whale opened its mouth just after that, and you see that speed drop down dramatically. You can see what's called the ventral groove blubber there on the left, that animal that looks kind of like a tadpole, its mouth is absolutely distended and engorged with food and with water. Unbelievable kinds of stuff. I'm so excited that we, uh, that we have this kind of work. So some of the things that we're trying to do is understand how changes in prey influence when and how whales feed. And I'm just going to show you a couple of plots that demonstrate how when prey changes what it's doing, the whales are able to change their behavior. So on the left, what you have here are two echograms. These are echo sounders going through the water and showing how much backscatter or things that have different densities of water are in the water column. In the top panel, you see what the prey are doing at night. And the dark red colors are the most dense prey. Yellows are a little less dense and then green and blue. And then where you have white is that there's no food. So at nighttime, what you see is that the prey are all up near the surface in almost a continuous prey layer. Contrast that with, excuse me, with the graph below, that's during the day. You see that the prey are deeper in the water column. They're in very, very dense patches, but it's much more dispersed. It might be harder for those whales to find them. Now, if you look at the panel on the right and you look at the third column over where it says feeding. Now, what each of those dots are is a feeding dive done by a tagged whale. And we're going from left to right, from midnight to noon to midnight and showing when this particular behavior occurs. And what you see is that from about eight in the morning until about five at night, and this is in the Antarctic, 
when that's basically uh, daytime, you see absolutely no feeding. Then at about 5 p.m., the whales start to feed like you see here, and they continuously feed throughout the night into the next morning. And then when it gets light out, the whales stop feeding. And when you look at what the prey are doing, you see these two very distinct patterns. What this demonstrates is that these whales are waiting for the prey to come to the surface where it's easier for them to find. They don't have to dive and take the time to explore their environment. If the prey is coming to them, they're gonna wait for that. And that's the most efficient way for them to feed. This is another way to demonstrate that same kind of thing in a different species. That was humpback whales. And these are minke whales that are in the same environment. What this, this is just a different way of displaying the data. So from the surface on the top to deep water on the bottom and going from dawn on the left to night on the right, what this heat map shows is in blue where you have very little feeding and in green where you have more feeding and yellow where you have the highest feeding. And what you see is that during the daytime, you have a little bit of feeding and it's in deep water. And if we look at what the prey are doing during daytime, you see that there's no prey at the surface. There's prey very deep, but there's not a lot of feeding. You contrast that with night when that prey does come to the surface and that's when all the whales start to feed again. So again, another demonstration that even as the prey changes its behavior, the whales are tracking that and are taking advantage of feeding when that prey is the most accessible to them to be the most efficient for them to forage on. So with that sort of background in mind, we recently um, worked on a great paper that was, that was led by Matt Savoka, who's a postdoc uh, in Jeremy Goldbogen's lab that was published in Nature a few months ago, where the image on the right is sort of the take home message from this, where we aggregated all of this data and found out that whales eat a lot more than we thought and that it actually matters ecologically. And so I'm gonna give away the punchline here and then I'm gonna show you how we got to this point. We find that whales eat about three times more than we thought and the reason that we thought that they didn't eat that much was because we'd never actually measured the food that the animals were feeding on, how many times the whales were feeding, and how much water the whales were filtering. And we have new technology, these tags that I showed you, that shows that these whales feed sometimes over a thousand times every day, depending on the species. And then the most important thing, I think, that came out of this paper was that industrial whaling took out so many whales from the environment that it actually had a fundamental shift in the productivity in the ocean, and that whales were a fantastic and fundamental part of seeding ocean productivity. And by removing whales, we might be able to demonstrate that ocean ecosystems are not as healthy and don't function as well or have as much productivity as they do when you actually have the biggest predators there. So how did we get to this? Well, some of the first information that we looked at was by looking at how much water an animal, uh, baleen whale, can actually get into its mouth at once. And this is a really cool paper that shows that the amount of water you can get into your mouth scales with body size. So the bigger you are, proportionally, the more water you can get in your mouth at once. And you saw how big the mouth was on that blue whale. Well, if you're a very small minke whale, and by small I mean about 12 meters long, when you open your mouth and fill it with water, you can get about 75% of your body weight in water in your mouth at one time. So if that whale weighs 10 tons, that means seven and a half tons of water go into your mouth every time you open it to feed and how much food is in there is, you know, dependent on the density of it, but that's a lot of water you can get in. But by the time you get to be a blue whale, you can actually get over 130% of your body weight in your mouth in one time. So if that whale weighs 100 tons, 133 tons of water can get into its mouth to process. It's an, a massive amount. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that these whales can be so efficient and can feed as much as we believe that they can. So this was some great work done by one of our grad students, a woman named Sherelle uh, Kahani Report. And what this shows is the different sizes of baleen whales going from a minke whale on the bottom to a blue whale on the top, what their engulfment capacity is in cubic meters. And again, this is just a, a demonstration that we've been able to put together because we've got this wonderful database from all of these different baleen whales and we can show how that changes as an animal gets bigger. The next thing we were able to demonstrate is, well, we know how big their mouths are. How often do these whales feed? And by putting out these tags over and over again in different environments for three species here, for the humpbacks on top, the blue whales in the middle, and then fin whales on the bottom, 
you can see that this is an estimate of the feeding rate or the number of lunges per day. And what's really interesting here is that humpback whale is about a third the size of a blue whale, maybe half the size of a fin whale. The bigger animals are more restricted in the number of times that they can feed per day. Some of this is because it takes a blue whale a minute to process a mouthful of water. So its feeding rates necessarily have to be a little bit lower than they are for something like a humpback whale that can feed a lot quicker than a blue whale. But as a big whale, there's a lot of variability in how many times you feed. And that probably depends on the environment that you're in, your motivational state, uh, and how much food is available to you. So for something like a humpback whale that's smaller, it may be able to persist in an environment where you have a different variety of prey types and different prey densities. Whereas if you're a larger animal like a blue whale or a fin whale, there's fewer circumstances when you're likely to feed and you really only feed when it's gonna be beneficial to you. So we see a very large difference in uh, the number of times that these animals feed in a given day. This is a really cool um, graph showing uh, we've been able to put these motion sensing and feeding tags on animals that actually extend on them for two or three weeks. And this is a wonderful data plot um, by a graduate student, James Falbush, and one of our colleagues, John Callum-Bakitis, who's at the Cascadia Research Collective. And they showed that for a blue whale that was tagged over an 18-day period, the animal lunged an average of 347 times per day. And what's great about this is it helps to demonstrate that there's not a lot of variability within a season if an animal is in the right environment. It's gonna feed over and over and over again. And this is important because the life history of baleen whales is such that you feed during the summertime, then you migrate in the wintertime, and you end up in a breeding ground where you typically don't feed for several months, and then you migrate again and you come back to the feeding ground. So these animals are likely only feeding for three or four months, maybe five months out of the year, and not feeding for the other months. So they need to do as much feeding as possible and they need to be as efficient as they can to gain as much energy as possible in a short period of time. So now that we've demonstrated how many times a whale feeds in a day and how big their mouths are, the next part of the equation is literally to do some multiplication and find out how much water gets filtered out by these animals. And so it's really cool to me and, and keep in mind that on, the, on this scale here, um, you're looking more at like a log scale um, where as you get bigger, those numbers are dramatically bigger in terms of order of magnitude. What you see here is that, remember, even though a blue whale uh, fed very few times relative to a humpback whale, you can see that the amount of water that it's filtering is substantially greater than that is for a humpback whale. So humpback whale feeds four times more than a, than a blue whale, but a blue whale probably processes 15 or 16 times more water in a given period of time because that mouth is so big. So now that we know how many times a whale feeds and how much water actually gets processed in that time, we need to add in the prey and what the density of the prey was like in order to understand how much they're actually eating. And so this is work that's been led by um, Dave Cade, who just finished his postdoctoral work in my lab at UC Santa Cruz. And what he was able to do was to come up with ways to use those prey data and actually, instead of binning them in a random way or an arbitrary way of say every 10 meters depth, let's average out the amount of food um, that is in the water column. Dave said, well, how big is the mouth of a whale? And that is the more functional spatial unit that we should be looking at. And so for each individual whale, you can look at the prey environment and it's gonna be different. If a minke whale only collects three or four cubic meters of water, its cell size is gonna be one size, but a blue whale that has 20 or 30 cubic meters has a very different cell size. So the functional amount of prey that's available for these animals is dependent on how big your feeding apparatus is, and that's gonna really impact how much you're able to consume. And this, it's hard, to, it's hard to overstate how logistically difficult something like this is to do. Putting a tag on a whale we've gotten pretty good at, and prey mapping is pretty easy, you just turn on your echo sounders, but doing these two things together and having the logistic support to put a tag on, follow a whale, and be able to do it so that you are mapping the same environment um, that the whale is in is logistically a very difficult thing to do. And one of the reasons we've been able to overcome that is because we have the capacity here in Monterey Bay to do things, and, and it's very exciting. So this leads to sort of one of the, um, the final pieces of the equation of how much food does a whale eat? And what we found is that it is a lot. 
<laughs> I'm not surprised that it was a lot, but what Matt was able to demonstrate in our paper was that the amount of food that these whales eat is three or four times greater than previous estimates. And so what each of these little distributions looks like, that looks like kind of a, like a mound, is the range of consumption rates for different species. The top three are non-Antarctic animals. These are the North Pacific. You have blue whales, fin whales, and humpback whales. And then in the bottom are two Antarctic species, humpback whales and minke whales. And the, the little brackets on top are what the previous estimates of daily consumption rate were for each of those species in the literature based not on any behavioral data, not on any prey metrics, but simply based on physiological constraints and what percentage of the body weight you estimate that the animal is likely to eat per day. And again, these were very wrong and very wrong in, a, in an important way. You can see that um, historically people thought that blue whales consumed between one and maybe three tons of food a day. And what our data show is that in the North Pacific, we see that blue whales probably eat an average of five, even more tons of food per day. Similarly, humpback whales in the Antarctic were thought to eat between 500 and 1,000 kilograms of food in a day. And uh, our data demonstrate that that's probably more like two to four tons in a given day. And so this is fundamentally going to change what we think whales do to the ecosystem and what the ecosystem needs to be able to support those animals. And so um, this is a big deal for us <laughs> in our little community to be able to uh, demonstrate in a quantitative way just how much food these whales are eating. So the next question that's kind of come up that, that we address in this paper is, what are the effects of whale foraging on an ecosystem? Um, this is an image of a blue whale taken from South Georgia, which was one of the, uh, the first shore-based whaling stations in the Antarctic. And it's a good demonstration of size. You can see, what is it, about, uh, about 10 guys standing in front of that blue whale, and they look like, they look like little figurines. You know, that's a close to a 100-foot-long blue whale uh, in that environment. So what this demonstrates here are the number of whales that were killed in commercial whaling enterprises in three different environments, the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, and the Southern Hemisphere. And, and note that the scales are very different. So the Southern Hemisphere, you're looking at um, annual takes of 20 to 30 to 40,000 whales. And the line there then represents what we believe to be the population that was left over uh, after commercial whaling. So in the North Pacific, for example, you can see that there was sort of episodic whaling that ended in the 1960s, that population decreased, but it has slowly been, uh, been increasing versus the Southern hemisphere where you see uh, almost complete extirpation of the species. And over time, since whaling has ceased, very little recovery of those animals. Now, what this graph shows is the exploitation of all of the different whale species in the Antarctic um, from about uh, 1910 up until about 1990. And you can see each kind of species goes up and, and goes down and, and gets killed over a long period of time. But to me, there's a couple of cool things to demonstrate here. One is that the only respite that whales got from commercial whaling was during World War II, when humans were much more um, focused on killing each other than they were on whales, and whales actually got a little bit of a respite. But what's amazing to me is if you look and you see that there are peaks in years, especially for fin whales after World War II, where you had 20,000, 30,000, 25,000 whales being killed every year for about a 20 year period. That's an absolutely extraordinary number of animals to be killed, let alone think that there are that many whales that were alive. Um, and what Matt's done here is he's shown um, sort of what the equivalent was in terms of biomass of how many whales were removed from this ecosystem, because it's hard to, hard to think what 2 million whales weighed and what that's equivalent to, um, but it's the equivalent to the biomass of two to three billion people on our planet, which would be about a third of our entire population right now. And under that, you can see um, what some of the, you know, kind of horrible catastrophic things that have happened, um, how many people they removed, and how minuscule that is in biomass relative to how many whales were taken out of this environment. Okay, so if we then want to think about what the legacy is of that, one of the most fundamental things is when you don't have whales, you don't have them eating food. And there's no better way to demonstrate this than look at the blue whale graph on the right. And what you see um, here first is, is how the populations have changed over time. 
um, but the estimated krill that's been consumed by those populations. So in the current time period, you see that blue whales, because there's probably several thousand of them where there would have been tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them, they are currently are eating between 10, 100,000 and maybe a million metric tons of krill annually. Versus if you extrapolate to when the population hadn't been, um, hadn't been wiped out, you're talking about tens of millions, hundreds of millions of tons of krill that that one species would be feeding on every year, which means the ecosystem had to have a huge amount of krill to be able to support that. And there's been some thought that when you remove whales from that population so quickly, there should be this absolutely massive overabundance of krill and that there's nothing in the world that can eat that much. You should see krill levels just kind of increase and increase because they're not being preyed on by the top down. Well, interestingly, that has not been the case. And there's been a number of, of publications that have come out. One of the best demonstrations of it is on the figure on the left by Angus Atkinson and his colleagues that show a long-term decline in the krill stock in the Southern Ocean. And what each of those red data points are is an estimate of how much krill was available in different parts of the Antarctic and going from 1970s up to the year 2000. The 1970s kind of reflects when whaling ended in the, uh, in the Antarctic. And you see that there is a precipitous decrease in the amount of krill that is in that environment. So there's some reason that there's not as much krill, even though you're taking out the largest predator and the largest consumer of krill, you should have this explosion of krill. Now, one of the things, and, and I, I stole this slide directly from Matt and it's work that he is doing in prep, so, um, so don't take a photograph of it, but he showed this really interesting crossover that I'd never really thought about doing to show historically how much food baleen whales took out of the marine ecosystem relative to humans. And what he shows here is that the 1960s was most likely this crossover point between when there were few enough whales and enough commercial fisheries that humans became the largest consumer of things in the ocean. But what's amazing to me is that if you look back at the beginning of the 20th century, whales were taking out 400 million tons a year of krill as a natural predator in that ecosystem, which is absolutely astonishing to me. And one of the things that that makes us think about then is, can we think about whales as ecosystem engineers? If they're taking out that much food, they're having to have an impact in an ecosystem. And is it negative? Is it positive? And what can we think about the ways that it might be, uh, that it might be occurring? So ecosystem engineers, again, this is a slide, for a slide of mats, um, are animals that, that modify, maintain, or create habitat either directly or indirectly um, by modulating the availability of resources to other species. One of nature's fantastic engineers is a beaver, and that's a perfect example of it. But we make the case in this paper that whales are also ecosystem engineers. And the mechanism you can see that this little Antarctic minke whale is showing is, is effectively the crop dusting technique. And I'll show you exactly how this works in what's called the whale pump. This is a paper published by Joe Roman and Matt McCarthy in 2010. And what it demonstrates here is that in the upper parts of the ocean, the things like phytoplankton and zooplankton, um, the things that are, that are contained in the upper upper part of the water column are generally limited in some way by some nutrient. And that nutrient in generally in most oceans is going to be iron. And so iron limitation might be one of the things that, that keeps productivity down in the ocean. And if there aren't a lot of ways to naturally input iron um, from storms, from, from erosion, or from other biological imports, what's the way that you can get iron into the ocean or into the upper parts of the ocean where the phytoplankton and zooplankton can utilize it? Well, what, what Joe and, and Matt came up with was whales are the ones that are doing it. Whales dive down deep, they eat a lot of food, they come up to the surface and they're potentially seeding that surface water in the ocean with iron that has been processed through their system. And this is called the whale pump. And we were lucky enough to put a tag on a fin whale once that ended up near the back end and why not show you guys what it looks like when a whale poops? It's a, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. And it certainly is not, uh, not holding back in any way. This is a, I can't remember if this is a fin whale or a blue whale, but it's, it's a very krill based species. You can see the very red, uh, red kind of orange krill. And this goes on for quite a while. You 
don't need to watch a whole lot of it, but you get the point here. Whales produce a lot of uh, a lot of feces, and so what this um, graph shows here is what the likely uh, amount of iron that was produced by these whales was given their prehistoric and their current levels of population over a longer or a shorter feeding period. So on the bottom for each species, for minke whales going from left to right, from minke to humpback, to fin whales, to blue whales, if the whales fed for 60 days, 90, 120, up to 180 days, we can see how much iron these animals potentially recycled um, either today versus uh, when they were historic. And what's interesting to see is that the current levels of iron that are being recirculated by whales is obviously not going to be a lot because there's not a lot of whales around. Historically, though, those numbers are absolutely enormous, and the magnitude of that is likely enough to see the oceans. So in a negative sense, we can think that whales are not playing as big a role as they once had in oceans in helping to promote primary productivity because there's not enough of them to be seeding the oceans, and that there is this positive feedback between having more whales and greater productivity and a greater influx or influx of the nutrients that are typically limiting environments to create phytoplankton growth. It's a bit of a downer, but there are some places where we don't have downers. And I think it's important to end with, uh, with some positive thoughts. Uh, one is that some populations of whales are undergoing extraordinary expansions. Humpback whales are a good example of that. In, in California and basically around the world, in the Antarctic specifically, we've been able to demonstrate that humpback whales are rebounding very, very quickly. Their annual pregnancy rates are extraordinarily high. We even have about 12% of the population of humpback whales that are both pregnant and lactating at the same time because there's enough food available for them. So some of the smaller whale species are doing good. And it's very important for us to be able to use these conservation victories um, to show the, the good things about ocean productivity and why uh, conservation and protective measures um, are important. We need to show and demonstrate that we have success when we do this, and hopefully this can be the impetus for being able to do this in the future. Okay, I wanted to just sort of end very quickly with one thing, and I think this is really important, is that the broader impacts and the opportunities that we have at a place like UC Santa Cruz to be able to not only share scientific information, but to come up with new and compelling ways to share information broadly outside of the scientific community, to me is one of the great things. And it's the thing, one of the things that I'm the most excited about being here. We're partnering with the Institute uh, of the Arts and Sciences. We've done a couple of installations and exhibits with Yolandi Harris um, in the music and art department. Um, the science communication program is an avenue for us to be able to communicate what we do. And the Seymour Marine Discovery Center is also another avenue that we have for uh, being able to share information and come up with new ways to share science more broadly uh, to diverse audiences. And lastly, I wanted to, to just sort of thank um, the Crawl Lectureship Series, the Ocean Sciences Department, um, everybody at Santa Cruz for making this possible, but also, uh, sort of promote the needs that we have. Uh, I've shown you data from a ton of projects around the world. Um, we need to work more locally. And one of the things I did when I first got to Santa Cruz was I, was I was fortunate enough to get a large grant from the Office of Naval Research to buy a new coastal research vessel that's being built currently. Um, in order to take advantage of that boat, we need to be able to be maneuverable. And we are trying to fundraise now uh, for a trailer and, and a, a truck to be able to take that boat up and down the coast to be able to work in more and more different ecosystems and to give more opportunities for us, not only to do science, but to use this vessel as a tool for education and to be able to train as many of our students as we can to do marine science, to be better stewards and to take advantage of the opportunities that they have at Santa Cruz. So if you're willing, if you're interested and able, I really um, would love it if, if we could gain some of your support. We've got a large contribution already in hand that is gonna be matched up to, I think, $15,000. Um, and again, we'd really appreciate your support. I'm happy to talk more specifically if anybody has questions. Um, there are links to the websites there where you can donate, or if you're interested in more information about the research we're doing as well, uh, you can go to my lab's website. And with that, I will stop. I'd love to entertain some questions. And uh, again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to represent the university and, and talk tonight.
All right, thank you, Ari. That was fantastic. And so if you have questions, uh, you can continue to po post them in the Q&A. I'm going to consolidate some and, and give them to Ari, but uh, all of these questions are also saved. And so if we don't get to it, I'm sure Ari uh, may reach out to you and, and answer you directly. And so just starting uh, kind of an easy question, but you know, th this is uh, amazing footage and, and a question came up, uh, where is the best place and how to, to get out into the ocean in California and, and see these whales? You don't have to go far. That's the great, that's the great thing. Um, almost year round, you can go out from Santa Cruz Harbor, from Moss Landing or from Monterey, and there are marine mammals um, quite close by. There are different species depending on different times of year, but um, there are baleen whales and killer whales and dolphins, sea lions and seals here year round. So um, almost anywhere is great. <laughs> All right, great. And so uh, an early on question that I thought of as well, uh, you make it look so easy to tag a whale. And can you say uh, how often do you does the tag fall off early, or you miss the whale? Or <laughs> you have to start over again. Yeah, well, of course, I'm only going to show when it works. You know, it would be very boring if I showed you a day in the typical life of what we do. But um, over the years, one of the things that's really helped is the more time we spend working with the animals, the more we understand their behavior, and it allows us to be more effective and more efficient. Um, having a a backyard where we can go out and test things like different materials on the suction cups in Monterey Bay has been really important as well. And we're at the point now where we can go out and probably put out five to 10 tags on a given day if there are whales around. Some days we get one or two. Uh, very rarely if there's whales around will we not get a tag out. And I'd say that the average duration for these tags is about 12 to 15 hours. Uh, sometimes the whales breach and they fall off or they just accelerate. It's not a great stick. Um, it's hard to miss a whale. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. If, if you can't hit the back of a whale uh, with the tag, we might want to restructure or reconsider where your strengths are. And there's lots of other parts of science that, that you might be, uh, might be good for. Fair enough. Maybe I'll stay away from whale tagging then. <laughs> <laughs> and so several questions came up. Um, so you, you showed this, this dramatic decline in the whale populations in Antarctica, and, and it continued even after whaling stopped. And, and yet then you talked about this, this amazing rebound as well. And, and so can you just um, talk a little bit about, you know, why did it take so long for them to start rebounding? And, and what was the process that, that's keeping them from just recovering? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one we don't, I don't think we know fully, but there are differences in the life histories of these species that I think are very important. Humpback whales all migrate to the same place to breed. And so even when your populations are low, you go to the same place and finding a mate is going to be relatively straightforward. Blue whales and fin whales don't have these consolidated breeding grounds where everybody goes. And so if you have a low population, you're dispersed over a bigger area, it may be that it's actually harder to find a mate. The other reason is, is simple size. So a blue whale um, reaches sexual maturity once it's basically a teenager, and it probably has a calf every three to five years versus a humpback whale that reaches maturity in probably half that time and can breed either annually or every two or three years. And so if you do a relatively simple population growth estimate based on, on those things, you'd see that a humpback whale can, can gain um, traction in its, in its population much more quickly than something that, that grows much longer and slower. Great, thank you, Eric. And so uh, we're getting short on time, but uh, one question or a uh, a type of question that's come up a few times is, can you speak a little bit about uh, other impacts of pollution, particularly plastics on whales? Yeah, there's been a, we've published a handful of papers recently and we're, and we're actually doing some work on this right now to try and understand the impacts that, well, quantifying how much plastic is getting into these animals. Now that we have a mechanism to know how much water they filter, that was a critical step. There's a recent study uh, published by folks at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and in, in, in Ambari showing that the accumulation of plastics, microplastics in the water column is not uniform, that there are places in the water column where you have higher densities and abundances of plastics. And not surprisingly, those actually overlap with the same depth ranges that whales feed at. Um, so we can quantify how much, how much plastic these animals are ingesting. The hard part then is to demonstrate what that impact is on the animals. And we're trying to develop some molecular techniques. 
that might show us whether or not there's some immunocompromising in these animals. We're using drones to measure body condition in these animals. And if we can link the presence of plastic in the consumption of plastic to changes in an individual animal's health, we might be able to show those impacts. Great. And another question that came up, um, several people were curious about the exact details, and this will be your last question, mm -hmm. of um, what's going on with iron fertilization. And so if the whales aren't doing that, has something taken that over or is it just there's that much less productivity? That's a great question, and it and it goes way beyond my uh, my my scientific capacity. This is this is one of the questions that I want to raise, you know, to a group of people that study uh, biogenic iron and phytoplankton, and and try and sit in a room together and figure out what might be causing that. Because it's it's incredible to think that whales could have had that big of an impact, um, but I think I think they can locally. And one of the things that I was trying to demonstrate with whales is that they occur in very finite places in very finite periods of time. It's not like they are uniformly distributed over these huge swaths of the ocean. And so you're much more likely to find that kind of an impact at a smaller and a finer spatial scale uh, where whales tend to be found. And that might be one of the keys to studying that. Great, and, and I've been told we can keep going with questions as, uh, up until close to seven. As, as long, long as they're not as hard as that last one, then yeah, we'll <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some more <laughs> easy ones then. Uh, um, so, so one question that came up is sort of a technical question, but how often can you reuse those tags? You said you recover them. Is it just a matter of um, removing the data and then charging the batteries and putting it back out? It is until it isn't. You know, these, these tags are, are quite ephemeral. There's not a big market. We work with the manufacturers to try and make them robust, but um, going down to, a, you know, a thousand feet in the ocean presents a lot of challenges for electronics. And so we have some tags that might be able to deploy 10 or 20 times, some tags that fail on the first or the second try. Um, and uh, it's, it's frustrating, but uh, yeah, we, we go through quite a few tags and, and they're not cheap, which is <laughs> unfortunate, but uh, um, they're made to be able to be reused, yeah, you know, for a couple of years at a time. Okay, great. And another really interesting question was about um, the idea of ecosystem engineers. And, and so it's a compelling argument that whales clearly function in that role. Uh, but somebody asked if there is, is, is that true of all um, large sort of megafauna that they probably have some sort of ecosystem engineer role? It'd be hard to think that they didn't, you know, to be honest. I think one of the, one of the things that I don't know is, and that makes marine mammals unique, is that they have to come to the surface and they're spending this time at the surface and they're moving nutrients from one part of the water column to another whereas other animals that are not air breathing may not have those same tendencies to move things vertically in the water column. Um, it's gonna depend on their distribution. You know, marine mammals move over great distances and uh, that can impact how much you engineer uh, in a given space. So I think the amount of endemism and the amount of food that you consume is absolutely gonna make those big animals likely. Yep. And I'm going to combine um, two questions here, but th there was a question about whale interactions, both with other predators. And so do whales um, respond to other organisms in the environment and change their behavior? And somewhat related to that, um, do you ever get the, uh, the feeling or does it appear to you that the whales are cooperating with you as researchers, that they're curious and interacting with you? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we kind of consider whales volunteers, right? So if a whale doesn't want to get tagged or doesn't want us to be there, it's very simple for a whale to, uh, to get out of our way and for us to not be able to find it. Um, whales changing their behavior, absolutely. We've been able to show with a species like Antarctic minke whales that get preyed on by killer whales that they change their behavior and that they really only occur in places that are known to be non-killer whale friendly habitats. So for those animals, sea ice is the very important physical feature. They spend most of their time in sea ice because killer whales don't go in there. And the way that killer whales attack minke whales is to chase them and exhaust them. And if you're in a very fragmented habitat and like a forest, you can't run in a straight line. It's very, very difficult to be chased. It's a good place to be if you don't want to get eaten. They very rarely venture out into the open water where we know that killer whales occur. In terms of whales being curious as well, I will say 100%. Um, and it, 
anecdotally, it feels like whales that have fewer people around them tend to be more curious. So for example, when we work in Stellwagen Bank off of Cape Cod or in Monterey Bay, where there's almost constant human presence, rarely do we have whales that seem curious, spend time with us, give us a look, come over, interact with us. Versus in the Antarctic, where most of those whales are growing up in an environment where whales are not part of that system regularly. And I would almost guarantee you, if you spend a week in the Antarctic on a tour boat looking at whales, you're gonna have humpback whales come over and spy up next to you, push your boat around, come and interact with you um, quite closely. And I think a lot of it is the novelty of, of that stimulus in their environment. And so there are also uh, a few questions asking for some more details about the whale poop pump. <laughs> and so uh, re with regard to that, it, uh, one person was curious as to uh, how big an effect is this if, if more often the whales prefer to stay at the surface and feed at night, and so they're not necessarily going very deep and, and then pooping at the surface? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I think some of that will depend on um, the mixed layer depth in the ocean. You know, like in the Antarctic, for example, uh, the mixed layer depth in the summertime might only be 20 meters, and that might be the real barrier between where nutrients are and are not. And 20 meter dive for a whale um, is, is basically one body length, um, which is a, you know, a trivial um, depth for them to have to dive to. Uh, it's a great question and it does change seasonally as well. There are different times of the year where the prey uh, do not come to the surface. And for example, blue whales, um, if we look at their feeding rates, they almost exclusively are feeding deep. That image at the beginning of a whale surface feeding um, was actually a pretty rare event for whales to be doing that. But, more often than not, those whales are feeding on very deep and dense prey. And I'll say that there's also a relationship between the density of prey and the depth that it's found. And so the deeper you go, the more dense the prey tend to be, the larger whales require denser prey in order to be foraging effectively. So the animals that are consuming the most and recycling the most are the ones that are probably spending the most time at depth and then bringing that uh, resource back up to the surface. Okay, great. And, and another really uh, interesting question was, um, you, you talked uh, briefly about uh, both um, time of day and seasonality, but at high latitudes, when you go through long periods in the summer where it's, it's bright out basically all the time, is there an obvious change in behavior? Do they have to dive deeper and go after those, those more concentrated patches because uh, the krill or other prey items are avoiding the surface for prolonged periods? That's a great question. Uh, one of my graduate students, Ross Nichols, um, his master's work was on that question specifically in the Antarctic. And we put out tags starting in January where you have 24 hours of daylight all the way into June where you have about four hours of daylight. And he shows that um, the foraging is very much linked to these diel patterns and that the phytoplankton in the early part of the year and the zooplankton don't have any choice but to be in the upper part of the water column because it's stratified as sea ice melts in that environment, that fresh water lens helps to keep things up at the surface. And I mentioned that mixed layer depth is pretty shallow. Those whales are feeding for 24 hours a day in very shallow water. And then as the season moves on, you see more of a diel vertical migration of those krill where you have a distinction between day and night and the whales sort of modulate their behavior um, accordingly. Great. And going back to a couple of uh, more technical questions, uh, one was just simply if if the tag uh, if you need to get the tag back, do you just lose the data if you don't get the tag back? And, and then another kind of related question is, uh, do you or somebody else have to go through all of that footage and and you know <laughs> process it manually, or is this all automated or some combination of the two? Yeah, so the first question is, yeah, if we, don't, if we don't get that tag back, we lose all the data. There's none of it that is transmitted. Um, it's all archived on that for that particular type of tag. There are other tags that are transmitting that can send off packets of data. And those have been very effective for things like seals that haul out on land and where you can even link up to either a satellite or a cell phone network and transmit data that way. But since whales don't spend that much time at the surface, we haven't gotten there. Uh, the second question, you know, we feel it's a wonderful privilege and opportunity, you know, as an undergraduate to be able to go through all of this wonderful data and, and learn about the lives of whales. And so uh, I'm sort of kidding, but not. 
there are parts of it that we've automated for sure because the volumes of data are enormous, but um, we are taking advantage of it as a, as a teaching opportunity. And when you have hundreds of hours of video data, it's a, a fantastic opportunity to get students into the lab, to train them up on doing ethology and to look through these and look for patterns and come up with ways to evaluate data that uh, is gonna be novel for them and that is contributing to these larger data sets. And several of the papers that, that were published in here were led by undergraduates in our lab, like the minke whales in the Antarctic. It was two undergraduates who led that project to go through all of our video data and quantify how much time minke whales were spending in sea ice versus not in sea ice by looking through all of those video data. Um, and that, those were just undergraduate projects. And so we're, we're doing the same thing in the lab right now. And the more data we collect, the more students that we have opportunities to, to interact with. All right, and so this didn't come up in the questions, but I'll ask it. Uh, how do I volunteer? You know, if, if you wanted to help, and this was super exciting, you know, are, are there opportunities to, to engage in this type of research? Yeah, uh, there are. And we're trying to come up with more and more ways to make it accessible and tangible. Um, I'll tell you a couple or a few ways. Obviously, our lab, and I, I showed that website, and maybe we can put it up in the chat. If you go to the website, or literally come to the office or the lab, or email me um, with interest that you have, um, we're always looking to find ways to get people engaged. Um, the nonprofit that Rafe mentioned, the California Ocean Alliance, that myself, uh, my wife, and some colleagues in the area started, um, we're actually running um, uh, a dose, effectively a docent or an adult education training program uh, that we'll be running this spring, where we want to be able to train volunteers to be able to know the natural history of the animals that we work with, and if there's interest, to have some of these skills so we could potentially outsource some of this um, uh, sort of archiving of footage and having people look through and help us with those data. So uh, it takes a little bit of training, but once you have that, I think the opportunities are great. And uh, honestly, the more people that we can have doing this, the more people will care. And then the more it becomes a mainstream thing and just part of, part of who we are. Okay. So I'm gonna give you um, two deeper questions, one going backward in time and one going forward in time. And so starting with backward, uh, a few people have wondered, you know, so you've emphasized the, the importance of them feeding and that they're both consuming vast quantities or were consuming vast quantities of productivity in the ocean and also pumping iron to the surface. But are there other important ecosystem uh, impacts and benefits that, that whales have had in the past and presumably still do, but at, at a reduced uh, level compared to pre-industrial whaling? Yeah, I, so one of the things that we're working on with that guy, Joe Roman, who first developed the, um, the pump hypothesis is now the conveyor belt hypothesis. And I mentioned that these animals migrate from their feeding grounds, which are typically at high latitudes, to their breeding grounds, which are typically in lower latitudes and in tropical areas. And the more animals that you have migrating and moving into those areas, those tropical areas tend to be even more nutrient limited uh, in some ways. And so the more whales you have going to those areas, either by, by birthing, um, by, by nourishing their young, or even by dying, might present you know, massive opportunities for an influx of protein or other nutrients into that system that when you have fewer whales just simply don't occur. Um, we know that whale falls are a really um, important facet of the benthic ecology and some of the deep water ecosystems. One of the first examples was out here in Monterey Bay, where I think it was a gray whale skeleton was shown when it, when it hit the bottom, how quickly um, it was consumed by a vast number of different organisms and how important that windfall of 20 tons of, <laughs> of, uh, uh, of material was to that environment. And the more whales you have along these migratory corridors or these feeding grounds, the more opportunities you have to see those benthic communities. Um, one thing that I think Matt Savoka is working on now is also thinking of these animals as carbon sinks and um, in ways that they might mitigate even climate change at certain scales because of how much carbon they can sequester. Great. And, and so then looking forward, uh, again, I'm going to combine a couple of questions, but I'm going to give you some details. And so a few people are interested in, you know, where are these trends going? And so specifically, uh, what are the likely impacts of climate change? And, and so there's loss of sea ice, for example, uh, which may make it more difficult for uh, the large whales to avoid orcas, uh, which may be hunting them. Uh, there's probably other examples that you could name. 
And then somewhat related to that, uh, are we expecting to see, or is there evidence that there's already changes in migration? And do the whales normally migrate together or are they more solitary? Yeah, so um, there are already some, um, some, some pretty concerning flags regarding migration and also species composition. And so one of the things that, that, impact, that climate change has an impact on um, disproportionately at the poles and that ecosystem and the amount of the area that is effectively polar is becoming smaller and smaller, especially in the Arctic. And what that means is that you have non-polar species or non-ice affiliated species that are able to be present and take advantage of those ecosystems um, when effectively they shouldn't be. So for example, humpback whales, gray whales are being found and heard more in the Arctic at times of year when they otherwise shouldn't have been able to be there. And they are effectively pushing um, the habitat uh, the habitat that's available for them means that it's not available for the ice affiliated animals like bowhead whales or narwhals or belugas. And so you can track the amount of available habitat for these animals that have evolved to be able to only exist in these sea ice kind of laden conditions. Uh, it's also manifested in the Arctic that um, copepods, which are one of the main prey items for something like right whales or, or bowhead whales, those are very intimately tied to um, to sea ice dynamics and uh, because of the climate change that's occurring there, copepod numbers are down and subsequently the prey base for those whales is likely decreasing quite a bit as well. And the same kinds of things are being demonstrated in the Antarctic Peninsula um, where we have humpback whales that are a non-ice affiliated species. They're there almost year round um, and minke whales like, like were mentioned uh, are being effectively extirpated from the areas that don't have sea ice anymore. But around the entire Antarctic as a whole, that system is relatively stable. And the influx of, of invasive species from, from other latitudes is more uh, only really occurring around the peninsula. OK, great. And so going back to some more um, uh, whale physiology, does the speed and travel of, uh, and the general area they're covering um, depend very much on the species and size of the whale? And so it, it, are they covering uh, larger or smaller areas that scale as a function of the size, or is it more you know, just species dependent as a function of their behavior? Um, it's a good question. I think ultimately it, it, re it relates to the availability of food and how food is distributed. And so, so for example, in the Antarctic, at the beginning of the summer season, the krill distribute very broadly over a very broad geographic area. And the, if you look at the movement of whales, they use a very large spatial area, even though they're feeding all the time. As the season changes and you get from summer into winter, the krill actually move inshore and aggregate into these massive prey patches. We've measured some of these to have 10 million metric tons of krill in them. They move inshore into these bays and fjords that have sort of deep pockets and the whales just follow them in there and then just sit on top of those prey patches and go bonkers eating those for some time. So the distribution of the whales and their behavior is very, very much tied at multiple spatial scales to, to that of their prey. And so for something like California, where you might have blue whales that feed exclusively on krill, humpbacks that feed on krill, but maybe also fish, depending on what's available, the humpback whales are gonna have more available habitat. The blue whales, they might travel more looking for prey patches, but once they find patches, they may be more locally resident in a place. Okay, and there was also another question. Uh, once they find that prey patch, is uh, are some whales more efficient in terms of um, foraging efficiency than others? And does that scale with size as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that we've demonstrated for sure that the bigger you are, the greater your foraging efficiency is. Um, and we've, we've demonstrated that for blue whales, fin whales, humpback whales, and, and for minke whales. Um, that efficiency also relates to the depth that you're feeding at. And the thing that changes the most is your capacity to feed and your feeding rates relative to how much prey is available. So like I showed with blue whales, even though they may not feed as many times, because their mouths scale and are so much bigger than a humpback whales, they're able to get so much more food more efficiently in a shorter period of time, in the same amount of time as a humpback whale that they can be um, much more effective. Yeah. Great. 
and, and returning more to the, the um, policy side and conservation, uh, there were a few questions about um, uh, whether there's uh, more uh, interest and emphasis on countries internationally coordinating to, to help uh, save the whale populations. And I know, I think it was Norway just said they're stopping industrial whaling. One of, one of the one of those countries Iceland. Is, Iceland. Iceland excuse me so could, could you talk a little bit about uh, where where you see the the human dimension going yeah that, that's a great question um, you know we just published a report with WWF called the uh, blue corridors report and I think it's available right now on WWF's website and what we did there was to aggregate all of the whale tracking data that we could from around the world um, that researchers have published to demonstrate that these whales that may feed in your backyard travel through seven or eight or 10 different countries along their migratory routes and are presented with risks you know, from different countries that have different policies at different times of year. Just because they are not present there doesn't mean that they aren't at risk in some way. And so I think the more that we can demonstrate that the scale that these animals use um, does put them in an international context and in that if we want to protect them, a whale that migrates from the Antarctic to Colombia goes through Argentina, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, all of these countries. And if one country along the way doesn't have uh, the right policies in place, then it's gonna be um, ineffective conservation wise. And a good demonstration of this is actually with right whales in the, in the North Atlantic. We know as a community that right whales get struck by ships and they die and they get entangled in fishing gear and they die. And these are animals that migrate from the US into Canada. And Canada does a great job of saying, we are gonna mitigate where our shipping, shipping activities occur because we know that if they occur in the same place as right whales, there's a likelihood that we're gonna get struck by ships. But if the US doesn't have the same policy, it's, it's ineffective because those same whales then still have the same amount of risk and one country is not kind of uh, pulling their weight. Um, it's very difficult um, to get policy, I think, to be unanimous across all these countries that have different needs, different priorities, different economic um, levels that they can support conservation at. But I think the impetus is there and the more we can demonstrate it. Uh, and if we can get the countries that have the means to help support those that don't, um, I'd like to think that we can do better. Great. And a couple last um, sort of technical questions that came up or specific questions. Uh, one person was interested in, in why it's always iron and, and thinking of Mike Roman's paper, I'm, I'm sure I know your answer to this, but uh, why not phosphorus or something else? And so what does it have to be iron? And so if it, you're not in an iron limited area, are the whales less important? That's a great question. Uh, I honestly couldn't, couldn't answer that uh, not being a chemist, but um, I think depending on the place you are, yeah, there are going to be differences in the types of nutrients that are limiting. And phosphorus certainly can be important in certain ecosystems. Great. And another uh, really interesting question. Uh, is there any evidence that the mysticetes use odor plumes or some other way of sensing the, the prey that they're looking for? Or is it strictly, you know, visual or some other sort of chemical cue? Yeah, this is, this is a, another one of these questions that has been very difficult for our community to wrap its head around. I think the best way to answer that is that whales probably use different senses at different scales. They probably use passive listening to either hear other animals that might be feeding and making sounds or prey patches actually make sound as well. A school of fish probably has an acoustic signature. And so at the scale that a whale can hear, that probably impacts them. Visually, if they're in the upper part of the water column, the whales are probably using visual cues to either look up and counter shade prey patches or actually see prey passing by. There's probably some tactile um, connection as well. Oftentimes when we see whales dive, they dive through a prey patch and then come out the bottom of it and then turn around and, and lunge back through it. And it's very likely that there is either a sensory organ um, at, well, their, their mandibles, their, their, their bottom jaws are not fused together like ours are. And it has been demonstrated that in fin whales, there's a small kind of nerve bundle or organ there that might be a sensory organ that whales are using to sense something in their environment. They also have a small number of hairs on their chin and around their head. They may be using those in a tactile way to um, access when they're hitting more or fewer prey. 
There are folks that are trying to use olfactory senses. Certainly when the whale is underwater, it's unlikely that they're smelling anything because they're not exchanging any air. But dimethyl sulfate is a byproduct of productivity that sometimes birds use um, and are, have been demonstrated to sort of work upwind towards prey um, that might be producing that. And it's, it's a bit ambiguous whether or not whales do that. It, uh, it's a little harder to do an experiment with a whale than it is uh, a seabird in that respect. But that would, be the, that would be the one situation where whales might be able to use an olfactory cue. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been incredibly fascinating and I learned a lot. I think uh, really the, the last um, uh, request is that uh, a few people have asked if you could just um, say again, if they wanted to support your work or um, look into volunteer opportunities, could, could you just um, let them know again uh, where a good place to start looking would be? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if, if folks are interested in contributing to the lab um, by going to connect.ucsc.edu, uh, our lab's uh, fund is the Marine Conservation Ecology Fund. Um, the California Ocean Alliance would be a great place to start and to connect with if you're interested in being a community volunteer and learning more about the natural history of these animals and taking those classes. Um, and then my lab, just specifically, if folks are interested in emailing me, um, you, can, you can find my name just doing a Google search and I'm happy to, um, to talk to anybody who's interested and speak offline about what we can do to support your interests. All right, thank you. And so I'll turn it back over to the Craws and appreciate uh, all of your uh, enthusiasm in the attendance and the fantastic talk. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Ray, this was harder than my prelims, I have to tell you. <laughs> well, thank you to our panel for sharing this important work with us tonight. Please join us next month for our next Craw lecture series, a lecture studying the behavior and physiology of marine megafauna in nature with uh, distinguished professor uh, Dan Costa, the director of the Institute of Marine Sciences at UCSC. Good night, everyone. Good night.